Hello everyone, so this is going to be the chapter on viruses from my microbiology class. The professor went over these notes on Thursday, and we have our midterm on Tuesday, this upcoming Tuesday. So let's get this last section in, and we'll go from there. Alright, so before we start in the actual bit of notes... He gave us this slide on a little bit of history on the viruses. So we had this tobacco mosaic disease. And this occurred in the 1890s. There are two of these scientists, Ionowski and Bejernik. They said that it could be caused by a filterable virus. That was too small to be seen with the light microscope. And the structure was found in 1958 by um, the famous female scientist Rosalind Franklin. She used uh, crystallography to find the structure of TMV. And again, more people are discovering that a filterable virus destroyed some bacteria. And the word virus will actually come from Louis Pasteur many years earlier than, you know, 1958. We're talking like a couple of centuries. Well, Pasteur, he coined the term virus first, and this meant poison. So there must have been like a very minuscule poison, something that's eluding these filters for bacteria. And so... That was kind of like the first idea on what a virus was. All right, so now let's actually go into the notes that have that icon that the teacher actually wants us to focus on. A virus is going to be an obligate intracellular parasite. They're going to need to enter a host cell in order for them to actually... Um, create more viruses and cause their effects. So usually they're just going to have DNA or RNA and a coat or an envelope. So they're going to be inert. They don't have metabolism. And again, they must hack or hijack the host's genome. And the cellular machinery. The host, of course, could be prokaryotic or eukaryotic. And we call the ones that affect bacteria, we call them bacteriophages. They also infect archaea. So if we are looking at a virus, again, that affects prokaryotes, we're going to call them bacteriophages. The smallest bacteria um, will be actually surprisingly larger than um, some of these viruses. Because again, viruses are extremely small. And I say some because there is a type of virus that was once considered a, a species of bacteria because of its large size. So when we're talking about viruses in general, they're going to be much smaller than the bacteria. The smallest virus will be about 10 nanometers. And this would be about 10 genes. Whereas the largest, which is known as E. mimivirus, this will be 800 nanometers. And they could have thousands of genes. A virion. Let's talk about the architecture now. Viruses. A virion. V-I-R-I-O-N. This is the particle. This will be the nucleic acid. Plus the coat. So protein coat. That's why P coat. So protein coat. This is called a capsid. And this will, of course, protect those nucleic acids. They are made of these subunits called capsomeres. 
and they're going to also carry enzymes. So if we have our um, capsid here, of course, there's going to be our uh, proteins, and then inside we're going to have our nucleic acids, which I'll be coloring pink just for the demonstration. When we have a capsid plus the nucleic acid, this will mean we're going to call it a nucleocapsid. So we're just going to combine those two words basically into nucleocapsid. Kind of redundant, but they're two separate things according to the notes. They wouldn't be listed um, as separate bullets if they weren't. So we now have enveloped viruses or enveloped viruses. Sorry about the pronunciation there. I'm still on poo brain. Um, enveloped viruses. And these will have a lipid bilayer envelope. There's going to be a matrix protein here as well. And it's going to be between the nucleocapsid and the envelope itself. Alright, so if we had our envelope to virus, the one that we drew earlier, let me Make two copies of it first. All right, so for envelope to virus, you're going to still have those spike proteins all around it. You're going to have an envelope, again, like a bilayer. So we could draw that on here. Let's draw that bilayer around it. And then also we're going to have in between the envelope as well as the actual nucleocapsid, we're going to have this inner layer here called the matrix protein. We could also have naked viruses too, or non-enveloped viruses. So naked viruses. These will not have an envelope. And they're more resistant since they do not have that envelope that will attack the lipids in the lipid bilayer. We don't have that on naked viruses, so they're more resistant. Okay, so a naked virus will basically look like our... Um, Again, enveloped virus, except we do not have that lipid bilayer around it. We still have spike proteins around the nucleocapsid, but we don't have that matrix protein, nor do we have the bilayer. All right, let's talk about the genome and the shape of a virus in general. So the genome of the virus can either have DNA or RNA. They can't have both. It's one or the other. And you could have linear or circular. You could also classify them if they have DNA or RNA. That's one way we classify them. And of course they could be double-stranded or single-stranded genomes. They also have these protein components. And these are going to be used for attachment. Again, the virus needs to be able to make contact as well as inject its genome inside the host cell in order for any effect to happen. If it's going to copy itself, if, it's, if it wants to go and lyse the cell after it's done copying and assembling, all of that must have that initial contact and then the insertion of that genome into the host. So some ways that the protein components will help with that in phages. These are going to be tail fibers. In animal viruses, these are going to be spike proteins or spikes. 
like COVID-19 will have these spike proteins and these will allow the attachment to specific receptor sites. That's why they have the tail fibers as well as the spikes on animal viruses. There are three virus shapes in general. We have the icosahedral, and this is seen in adenoviruses. And it kind of looks like this very wild geometric kind of shape here. You have like a triangle there. Um, you have more triangles. It looks like they all come to a point, so I kind of need to draw that inwards. So basically, it looks like one of those crazy 3D polygon shapes that you would see maybe as, a, you know, like a gemstone cut or something like that. Um, we also have helical. These are going to be your TMV, so like um, the tobacco matrix virus. We're going to have this long tube here, and inside that cylinder, we're actually going to have the spiral um, genome. It's packed in there like a spiral, and again, this is going to be TMV. We also have the complex form, which is seen in bacteriophages. This is going to be that War of the Worlds um, kind of like space invader looking virus that you see in all those electron microscopes because it's so technological and kind of bizarre how they actually look. They look like these, again, like space invaders or War of the Worlds or something like that. Those are going to be bacteriophages. All right. Let's talk about the classification of bacteria now. We went through kind of their physicalities up here. Let's talk about the classification. So the virus family will be denoted by viridae. And some will be addressed by appearance like coronavirus, that means crown in Latin, so corona, that's crown, I think it's Latin, it might be Latin or Spanish, one of those, um, and again, the coronavirus has like all these spike proteins because it's an animal virus, and so if you look on one side, it does kind of look like a crown, um, others will indicate the region of origin, such as the Bunginia day. Let me write that somewhere else. We have space. And this is a virus that originated in uh, Bunyamira in Uganda. And then we could also have the genus. So bacteria genus will end in virus. So, for example, enterovirus, that's a genus. Then species is the name of the disease. So, um, poliovirus will be, of course, causing polio. All righty. Let's go and talk about the route of entry. We also have um, means here to kind of address viruses in formal light. So um, unrelated viruses will be sharing the same route of infection, um, the oral fecal route or the digestive route that will be enteric. So this is going to be gastrointestinal. Some of them will enter via respiratory. That means the air. Um, there's zoonotic viruses. 
that root there, zoo, means animal, so from animals. And there's also arbovirus, which is from insects. And then STDs could also be viruses, and that's kind of that's kind of um, self-explanatory that route of entry there. All right, let's now talk about some of these um, stages in a virus's being. <coughs> Sorry about that. All right, so we have two stages. We have the lytic and the lysogenic cycles we're going to be talking about the lytic phase this time all right so in general this means the host will be killed or lysed as the um new particles are released and this is a productive infection takes about 30 minutes. All right, so the steps in general, we have number one, attachment. This is where that phage's tail fiber will attach to a receptor on the host. So let's say I have my um, space invaders from another galaxy coming on to our bacteria right here they're going to bind to those receptors and the latch on we could also draw the bacterial chromosome while we're at it all right that's the first step second step will be entry this is when the genome is injected First, we're going to, of course, have the cell wall degraded by a lysozyme, um, and then we could inject our DNA, the viral genome, into the bacteria, the host. Right, so that's going to be signified by that. All right, now, synthesis. We're in our synthesis step. That's number three. This one has a ton of things, so first, we're going to be able to, again, hijack the cellular machinery. The viral GM is going to be translated. We're going to first get our early proteins, which are the first ones to be translated from the viral genome. Um, they're going to be nuclease to degrade the host DNA. So it's going to be degraded. It's going to be... Uh, ruined and messed up. Um, the protein will modify host RNA polymerase to not recognize its own promoter. So we have another protein here to stop RNA pull from re finding or recognizing the host promoters. So we're really going to start shutting that stuff down, as you can see. Next, we'll have our late proteins. These are going to be structural for the virus. So these are going to be the capsid, the tail. All right, so now we have all those components inside our cell because the genome was translated. So maybe that's a capsid, you know, there's our parts. Maybe there's an enzyme here just trying to degrade that host DNA, so that might be our nucleus that was made first. All right, now let's go to uh, part four of this blockbuster, which is assembly. This is when those virus avengers will assemble. And so we have all our components. It's kind of like Lego, so we're going to now put them all together to form new particles, to form new virions. Some of them will spontaneously assemble, so it means like if we have the, uh, you know, the head looking region, then we have the legs. And um, there's going to be some help from some protein scaffolds. Put 
all these viral particles together. And now number five, we are going to be releasing the phages. And of course, since we're in our lytic phase, this means the cell is going to lyse, and the lyse, which is produced late in the infection, will again digest that cell wall. And the burst size, which is like how many are made in this one cycle of the lytic phage. This is going to be for our T4, and there's going to be about 200 new viruses are made and released. And so, when all those particles, again, burst out, cell dies, and now we have all these new uh, creepy space invader viruses. Alrighty. Now let's talk about a temperate phase in the lytic cycle. So a temperate phage will have two options, either the lytic or the lysogenic. Lytic, we already uh, described up here once the other viral particles are made, they burst and kill the cell. Lysogenic infection, however, this is much different. So the DNA of the phage, so phage DNA, will actually go into the host genome. Now, this will create a, lys a lysogen, which is that host cell that now has the phage DNA inside of it, integrated. Um, the integrated phage DNA will become something called a prophage. So there's a prophage inside the lysogen, because the lysogen is the cell that has the infection in the lysogenic, um, in the lysogenic pathway. But then the prophage, that's what we call the DNA, that's now in the host genome. Okay, so the prophage could either be excised to enter the lytic cycle, or we could also um, go and just keep it there and store it for later. So when the excised um, prophage will enter the lytic cycle, this is called phage induction. And this will allow for kind of like um, abandoned ship, it will escape the damaged host. And then, you know, the lytic cycle will happen. All right, so now we also have a picture here of the, um, the temperate bacteriophages going through there. It's basically like the lytic drawing, but then we do have that part where the integrated DNA could just stay there, stay there the prophage, um, the bacteria could go under cell division, and, um, you know, excision might happen, then we go into lytic cycle. Okay, so let me see where I could find something else here. Okay, so the lysogen, again, that's the infected host that has the phage DNA inside of it. Let's talk about it a bit more. And this could be immune to super infection. You might be like, what's super infection? We're already infected, so is it possible to get infected again? So yes, super infection will be prevented as the gene expression of incoming phages is blocked. So once a lysogen is created, it won't be infected by any new incoming viruses. The um, bacterium will undergo the lysogenic conversion, which will change the phenotype. So the conversion will also change phenotype. This is seen in uh, Corinia bacterium. 
this is that species that has all those like palisade characters um the phage itself creates the toxin not the bacteria the phage does and of course that toxin of the cornea bacterium that causes diphtheria Alrighty, now let's talk about filamentous viruses. Alright, so these are going to be single-stranded DNA phages. Um, they're going to, of course, look like fibers, hence the name filamentous. Um, they're going to bind to the F pillus. Remember that's used for trans that's used for not transduction. What's the other? Conjugation. That's used for conjugation. The host is not killed. However, the um the host will grow slower. So this is going to be a productive infection. So host gets slowed. We have this M13 phage, so the M13 or MI3 phage. This is going to be um, attaching to E. coli um, F. pilus. Again, that's for conjugation. Um, the single-stranded DNA genome will enter, so SSDNA enters, and then um, this is going to be extruded by the host. Okay, now let's talk about the um, roles of bacteriophages in horizontal gene transfer. So one of them is going to be generalized transduction. Again, this is another way that bacteria will be receiving new genetic material through transduction using a phage. And in generalized transduction, the phage will, dis will discard and degrade the host chromosome. And when this happens, sometimes those fragments will be picked up. And um, placed into the phage's head. So picked up, and then they're going to go into the new phage's heads. Um, the uh, phages with the host chromosome in them cannot direct phage replication cycle. Um, they have the host DNA, so they really can't um, do any of that. So, they don't have the viral genome anymore. Um, so, these are going to be called generalized transducing particles. Gen, trans, everything, particles. And after release, they bind to a new host and inject the DNA. And when they bind to the second host, they may combine DNA via homologous um, recombination. And then the um, host DNA will be replaced. So the second host genome will be replaced by this. Um, and any gene from a donor cell can be transferred. So you could use this for biotech or bioengineering. So now we have a second host. So host uh, one here, let's say, um, it, you know, burst, we have some phages, and some of them 
do have host one. Okay, so now this bacteria will find, I mean, not bacteria, this bacteria phage will find host two, which is another bacteria, you know, inject. And now it has host one's um, genome in there as well. Okay, so when this happens, of course, this will um, replace the host DNA, replace it with host one. So now host two has host one and you could use bioengineering to plant genes of interest in this method. All right, let's talk about specialized transduction. That was our generalized, so now this is going to be the specialized version. The phage DNA is integrated to make a prophage. Again, the prophage will be up here in our notes. Let's go back. So when phage DNA enters the host genome, this will create the prophage, which is that piece of the phage DNA that entered into the genome. And this will take some of the close areas of the host genome with it. So again, the key point here is it'll only take the close areas of the host genome when, you know, it goes through the process. And this will go into the lytic cycle. So again, a um, piece of flanking bacterial DNA removed during excision um, of the temperate phage from most chromosome excised DNA incorporated into phage heads. They bind to a new host and inject the DNA. The bacterial genes may integrate via um, reek and only bacterial genes adjacent to the integrated phage DNA can be transferred. So instead of everything, it's just a small portion, so whatever it was close by that form of transduction. And bacteria do have defenses against all these bacteriophages. They're like little computers, so they have their own firewall and all that to deal with them. They have a very, um, they have a very um, interesting and kind of strange, in my opinion, they kind of have like their little own immune system. All right, so these are going to, of course, be the defenses they have at their disposal. So we have capsules and proteins first. All right, so um, protein A will be one of these proteins and it's going to be found in staph, staphylococcus. And this is going to mask the receptors So again, when we mask the receptors, there aren't any chances of binding, and then no infection, none of that hijacking happens. A capsule or a slime layer will also help in the same way. Okay, next we could talk about restriction enzymes. These are going to cut out short sequences. And again, there's going to be a level of specificity here. So they're going to cut the incoming phage DNA. There's also going to be modification enzymes. Let me highlight some of these. So mod enzymes. And these are going to methylate the host DNA. Again, methylation, when we methylate DNA, we're kind of saying, okay, this strand is of interest. It's going to be important for us. This is our own. We're going to either use it as a template if we were talking about um, DNA replication and doing repair. 
um, it would be saying this is the template, this is the perfect strand, use this as a guide. Well, when we're methylating the host DNA and talking about the bacterial defense against the phages, this means um, don't go after this part of the DNA. This is the host DNA. This is your own DNA. Um, phages actually counter attack here. So counter by phages. Do you know what they do? They just methylate their DNA too. They'll just methylate their genomes at the same time. So it's kind of a back and forth. <laughs> it's kind of a back and forth. It's really an arms race between the bacteria and the viruses constantly happening. They just go at each other constantly. It's it's pretty interesting and silly and kind of entertaining too. Very interesting though, nevertheless. All right, now let's talk about CRISPR. All right, so we already talked about those crazy defense systems that bacteria have against viruses. This is basically going to just blow your minds if you've never heard about this. It's a recent discovery in bacteria, and the name CRISPR means clusters of regularly interspired um, short palindromic repeats. So basically, um, this is when, let me get to my notes here. So when a phage infects a bacteria, and of course the DNA of the invader will be chopped up. Some of that will be saved by the host itself. Let me write host first. So the host, the host bacteria will actually save some of those fragments that are invading genomes from the, from the phage. And so basically they have like a hit list or I don't know what you want to call it, a rogues gallery. So this is like Batman's rogues gallery. Where, he, you know, he has tabs on the Joker, he has tabs on the Penguin, he has tabs on Riddler, he has tabs on um, Hush, all of his villains. He has all this information. This is kind of like what the bacteria are doing using CRISPR. They have tiny pieces of these phage fragments of their genome, and they're going to store them away. They're going to transcribe these stored pieces into RNA, and then this is going to be seen by something called the CAS, which is an endonuclease protein. So CAS, endonuclease protein. So CAS is going to find these. They're going to make kind of this, um, a, a, kind of like a missile or a defense mechanism. I called it a missile in my notes, and the teacher also called it a missile. So they make this kind of a missile or a projectile or targeting system. Um, they're going to be targeting with a spacer. And they're going to be targeting invasive genomes. The invasive genomes that they have stay stored away and uh, saved into their bank or their rogues gallery. And then once they um, get that um, identified, that's when they're going to go on to the advantage. This um, saving of some of those fragments is actually going to be formally known as the CRISPR array. You could think about it, again, as a rogues gallery, but in formal terms, it's known as the CRISPR array. They could actually hold up to 30 of these fragments of different, different phages, genomes. So again, CRISPR RNA will be um, combined with the Cas endonuclease protein that's going to identify those phage DNA, and then it's going to block anything that has a match. That is wild. They have their own like little computing systems. 
All right. So now let's talk about the study involving bacteriophages. So when we're going to study the phages, we need a host. And luckily, the um, bacteria gundae are able to grow exponentially, so we get a ton of those hosts ready for tests. We're going to be using plaque assays. Which is kind of a method using a plate. Um, there's going to be soft agar. And we're going to be making um, a lawn of the pathogen or the bacteria that we're trying to uh, study the phage with. Okay, so um, we're going to again get some samples from sewage or soil. The host will be on the soft agar. The specimen will be poured on top. All right. And now zones of clearing on this soft agar of the lawn. Um, this is from bacterial lysis, which we saw earlier when we're going through the cycle. So this could be um, from those infected um, hosts that are going to be um, bursting, you know, letting the new virus particles out. These are actually going to be called our plaques. This is what they mean by plaque in the plaque assay. And when we're counting those plaques, we're going to actually say um, PFU, so plaque forming units. And that's going to be yielding a teeter. Let's talk about animal viruses very briefly. So the um, infection cycle is pretty similar. So you're going to see some um, concepts here from the, lys the lysogenic analytic cycles that we talked about with bacteriophages. So again, we have attachment. I should say animal up here. Animal like the Muppet, I guess. He was an animal um, virus. I don't know. Um, so animal attachment. Here we're going to be using glycoprotein receptors. And there needs to be multiple sites of binding. So one or more sites of binding. So, for example, HIV virus will be binding to two areas. Um, the normal function is unrelated to the binding. And, of course, we're going to have specific receptors or tropism. So, again, that's specific receptors, which are needed, and this will limit the range of the virus. Let me just highlight that because it is kind of a vocab term. Um, dogs cannot contract measles from humans because of that tropism, which is required when we're talking about animal viruses. Next, we have something called penetration, but right beforehand, let's connect this to COVID-19. So COVID-19 um, can be blocked by binding antibodies. Actually, let's use the actual abbreviation for antibodies to the receptors and the spikes. All right, now let's move on to step two, which is penetration. When non-enveloped or naked viruses get to this step, um, endocytosis will happen and there will be the usage of a vesicle to bring that virus in. However, with enveloped viruses, or enveloped viruses, so you have 
two different methods here. This one's for enveloped. They're just going to fuse the membranes. And the virus will just slip in through the membrane. The capsid will be released from... Wait, yeah. Capsid, then the nucleic acid will be released from the virus. All right, now let's go to synthesis. We're making stuff now. Alrighty, we're going to, of course, make the uh, genome copy. So we're going to copy virus genome. Again, using the cellular machinery of the host, this is a hijack, this is a breach. Red alert, you know. Um, they're going to enter the nuclear pore. And there are three general replication strategies depending on the type of genome. So we have one for DNA viruses, we have one for RNA viruses, and then we also have reverse transcribing viruses. So for DNA viruses, we're just going to go through the simple central dogma. You know, uh, DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. We're just going to be doing that single-stranded DNA. However, we need to get the other strand first, so... So there's a little bit of hiccup there with single-stranded DNA in the viral genome. We do need to make it complementary before we could go into the central dogma. In RNA viruses, we have a different process. We have to use um, RNA replicase in the cytoplasm. And there's no proofreading here. So tons of errors could happen. This is where we get our antigenic drift. And when we have antigenic drift because of that lack of proofreading in the synthesis of RNA viruses, this will lead to variants. Like all those variants we saw with COVID-19, this is where they're coming. Um, they're going to, of course, replicate the RNA, the cytoplasm, uh, the polymerase or replicase, um, will allow for that antigenic drift. And then now we have all these variants of flu as well as COVID. So please stay safe out there, everyone. All right. And then our final type will be reverse transcription or transcriptase um, viruses, also known as retroviruses. These ones are going to be um, maybe the most complex out of those three synthesis strategies in animal viruses. And these are going to be single-stranded RNA, such as HIV. That's a, that's a version or like, you know, an example of that. Um, let me see what I have to write here. They could be either productive or latent in their infection. All right, uh, so reverse transcriptase, that's going to be used here. That's an enzyme. And from its name, it's going to take the um, single-stranded um, RNA and make a single DNA from it, a single-stranded DNA from that RNA. Um, the complementary DNA strand will be synthesized. The double-stranded will be integrated. So DSDNA uh, virus integrates. And this is going to be like the prophage. Except it's not going to be a bacteriophage. We're talking about animal viruses here. Alright, and unfortunately, with this revert, the retrovirus, there isn't a treatment. 
there isn't a treatment because we can't get into, unfortunately, we can't get into the genome of all those cells that have been affected in an animal or in a human. Um, so unfortunately, there's no treatment. So that, um, we have to just be really careful. And then, you know, if there's drugs or medication that could um, lessen the chance of this or, um, you know, lower those levels of the retroviruses from hijacking that cellular machinery at that, such an alarming rate, we could help, um, you know, curve or decrease um, that using those. Because this stuff is very important. Retrovirus is extremely important to um, um, address as well as combat as best as we can. Because you don't want the, again, these are hijackers of your cellular machinery. You don't want things hijacking your system. That's with computers. That's also with living cells. All right, let's talk about assembly. This is going to be just kind of a, a repeat from the bacteriophage. So the assembly is going to either take place in the organelles or the nucleus, that's something different because that, because again, the bacteriophages won't be infecting hosts that have organelles. So that. All right, um, I should write in organelles. There we go. Next, we have release. So the enveloped viruses or enveloped viruses these will bud off the spikes will insert into host membranes and then there'd be a covering so the matrix will now cover it That's again the matrix protein, and then we also have the lipid envelope. In non enveloped viruses, it's going to be a bit different, and they're just going to go through the lytic phase. This is again bursting once all those copies are finished. And what's interesting about the envelope viruses, we talked about how they're going to get some of those um, lipid envelopes. Sometimes those are from organelles themselves. It's very interesting. All right, let's talk about types of infections now. We have acute. This is going to be rapid onset, short duration. This is going to be like the flu. Let me sick for a tiny bit. Um, chronic infections. This means a continuous production. Of the virus. No symptoms though. And then latent if infections. This will be when the virus is in the neurons as a provirus. This is basically like the most dangerous because could keep reactivating it. That's why these are so dangerous. An example would be herpes. And those cold sores will keep just popping up whenever it's whenever it's reactivated. Okay, so now let's talk about viruses and their relation to cancer in humans. In order to talk about uh, viruses and cancer, we have to talk about the system in place in our cells that actually 
um, is related to cancer. So we have tumors. Again, that's abnormal growth of cells. And um, a cancerous or malignant tumor could actually metastasize, and that's when it goes somewhere off. There are two types of genes that work in this system here. We have our proto-oncogenes. And this is going to be um, growth. This is like our go pedal in a car, our gas pedal. Um, the suppressor. This is going to be our stop. So of course that's like the break. A viral oncogene um, is very similar, so I'm going to just say they're equal. They're very similar to the host oncogene, specifically the host proto-oncogene. So when the viral oncogene is very similar to the host proto-oncogene, which is again, that's like our gas pedal, that's saying keep dividing, this actually will interfere with the host control system. And then since that will interfere with host control, we might unfortunately get this horrible um, condition where we have an increase in tumors or abnormal growths. And then with an increase of tumors, those might become cancerous or malignant and they're going to metastasize. And that is an unfortunate and horrible situation when that happens. A lot of cancers are caused by viruses. Um, we have papillomavirus, um, HPV. We have cervical cancer, Epstein-Barr that causes Burkitt's lymphoma, um, herpes. We also have that will be causing a, a T-cell leukemia from the human T-cell leukemia virus. So a ton of these will be um, caused by the viruses that have oncogenes. We also get mono from a virus too, so that's another of these unfortunate diseases or illnesses we get from viruses. All right, now let's talk about cultivation of these animal viruses. Um, you could either use live animals in labs. This is what will happen. Um, sometimes they use chicken eggs. That's why they ask if you're allergic. Each time you get a flu shot, I'll start asking, oh, are you allergic to chicken eggs or fertilized chicken eggs? It's because that's how they cultivate the animal viruses. Um, nowadays, they use cell culture or tissue culture. So like those H-E-K-T-293 cells um, that I used in lab in cell bio. Those are the human kidney cells, 293T, I think. And those are human embryonic kidney cells. And that's a cell line that um, you could use to process and obtain primary cultures. And the drawback is that they only have a limited um, division number. So they could only divide um, a certain amount of times. You can't really do it multiple. However, if we have a continuous cell culture, so um, live animals, that's kind of just, you know, that's not a vocab word. So continuous cell culture, which is from tumors, um, could be used indefinitely since the tumor cells do not have that suppressor. They only have those proto-oncogenes, which are always telling them to keep dividing. There's a line of these um, continuous cell cultures um, from the 1950s called H-E-L-A, and this is from a woman named Henrietta Lacks. And this 
continuous cell culture has been used for vaccines as well as other um, studies. And now we are actually getting um, some ethics concerns, which is good. It's always good to maintain good ethics. And they're going to be helping her, the scientific community. They're going to be helping her family get some of that credit as well as that uh, monetary compensation. So... And that's always a good thing. They're reaching out to them finally, um, giving them the credit and giving them the recognition as well as helping them out um, in their life um, for all the um, usage that the cell culture and all the advances that we've been able to do in this field thanks to um, the you know the technological advances in the availability of these techniques so um it's very good again good ethics and science that's always a plus to see um the families getting um of course the support which is wonderful and and they're entitled to it so very interesting um turn of events there right now we could talk about the effects of viruses on plants very briefly um this was only one slide so many viruses actually do change the morphological um aspects of plants so you're going to have these cytopathic events and changes there we go um the cells may change shape And they're going to cause um, a fusion into a multinuclear uh, synixin. Synitium, actually. That's actually a vocab word. Let me highlight that. And this is also seen in RSV. Um, a tulip mania crash. Um, so there's a tulip mania in the Netherlands, in that area of the world, Netherlands, Holland, Denmark, all those um, places in that area of Europe, and they wanted those stripes, but the stripes on those tulips are actually caused by a virus. There isn't any specific immunity either, or special immunity. This is, of course, an infection caused by um, a wound or something like that. These plant viruses could actually wipe out whole fields of crops. So, um, unfortunately, they could cause droughts and food shortages. So, we need to be careful about that. One last thing will be our other non living um, infectious microbes, our viroids, which are again the most simple as you could go. This is a single stranded RNA uh, molecule that's infectious. They are about one-tenth the size of the smallest RNA virus. That's their size. They're very minuscule. Um, they're going to form a closed ring because of the hydrogen bonding of the RNA to give it a double-strand look. And they're found in plants. They're going to, en again, enter through wound sites where the plant has been injured. Okay, let's talk about prions now. So these are going to be infectious misfolded proteins. YouTuber Charlie, he actually made a whole video on prions, which is pretty interesting. Um, they're going to be protein again. That is misfolded. In the brain and there's only going to be one species transmission um, the neural tissues in the surrounding areas will be misfolded as well and then this will cause progressive diseases 
and life-threatening diseases at the same time, too. Um, such as those that just lower the brain function over time. And these are extremely slow, fatal, and horrible um, diseases that we need to um, spread awareness as well as find ways to combat these as fast as possible. Another disease that could be caused is mad cow disease, which in England killed 177 people. Um, the prions will accumulate in the neural tissue. The neurons will die. There's going to be some of these holes and gaps. And then, of course, unfortunately, this is the worst thing ever. Um, the brain function will deteriorate over time. And this is such a horrible thing. Um, this will give rise to the general term for all the diseases which are uh, transmissible. Spongiform. Encephalopathies. And um, to avoid contact with brain matter that might have prions, um, it's best to not eat wild meat or wild deer or anything like that that hasn't been regulated or hasn't been checked. Um, so prions, again, are very tough to get rid of. You have to um, use a lot of heat to get rid of them, um, autoclaving or incineration at very high temperatures for a long time will be your only defense if they get onto um, objects. And then, of course, not eating brain matter would also decrease your chance of getting them, but these are very, very dangerous. Alrighty, that was all about viruses as well as quasi-life, so we touched on the um, viroids as well as the prions at the end there. We looked at um, bacteria viruses as well as animal viruses and all their different traits in a general sense. All right, thank you so much for tuning in. Please do something nice or someone. Please be safe out there, and good night to all of you. Take care.